Um, before we start tonight, I, I have a testimony that I'd like to share for our young brother Samuel, who was baptized on Sunday the 20th, so that would have been last Sunday. Uh, four days later, on the 24th, which is Christmas Eve, he had the opportunity to lead a young girl to the Lord at a house they were visiting. Wow. So isn't that awesome? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And that's, you know, he's been here every week for months and years, really. So he's heard everything that we've been talking about, and he's been doing it. <laughs> so never too young, never too old. Amen. All right, we're starting a brand new study tonight, John chapter 1. Did everyone get notes? Okay, good. I try to pick out the right number every week. <laughs> Are there any left, Gail? Where did she go? Any notes left? You have two, two left. Okay, good. Well, I was close. All right. <laughs> Does anybody want their own set of notes? I know the couples are sharing, so everybody's good? Okay, let's open up in prayer tonight. Uh, this is really my favorite book, the book of John. Uh, I read this book for a whole year when I first got saved. I wouldn't go to any other book, no James, no Peter, no nothing, just the book of John. And I took my advice from the guy who uh, shared Christ with me, and I'm so glad I did, because I got to know Jesus really well through the book of John, so... Let's pray tonight, and let's ask the Lord to bless us. Amen? Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful gathering tonight, Lord, of your saints, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my eternal family. I thank you for them, and I ask that you bless us tonight as we study your word. Father, your word is alive, it's full of power, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of our soul and our spirit. So I pray tonight, Lord, that you will teach us and bless us and use us like you did Samuel for your glory. Thank you for blessing us, Father. We, we pray that we are a blessing to you as well. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. It always is very encouraging to get a, a good group of people together to study the word of the Lord. So John chapter 1, I'm just going to read through verse 9, and then we're going to go back and go over uh, some of those notes, okay? Uh, by the way, before we start, we read a scripture today that said uh, there is only one God, one faith, one Lord, and uh, there's so many different cults out there that don't believe Jesus is God in the flesh. They believe he's a good man, he's a good prophet, good person but not God in the flesh. And uh, this will give you lots of proof that he is God in the flesh, God incarnate, come to the earth to save us. Amen? And the only vehicle he could relate to us with was being born just like we are. So um, John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. It's interesting, verse 3, all things and there was nothing that was made without him. So God really wants to get that point across. Everything Jesus was the architect of. Verse 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And that was the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. Praise the Lord. Let's go back through verses 1 through 3. So, simply put, the Word was in the beginning. And all things were made by Him. The Word is God. But let's prove that. Now, the Bible says by two or three witnesses, every word will be established. I figured nine witnesses were better. <laughs> okay. 
I'm the kind of guy that doesn't use a fly swatter, I use a sludge hammer. Okay? The fly has to be dead. Okay? <laughs> so let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Very first verse in the very beginning of your Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So we've established the fact that it was God who created the heaven and the earth. Remember what we just read? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So that could be confusing. Wait a minute. Did God make heaven and earth? Or did the Word make heaven and earth? Or is the Word God? So we're going to prove that. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 19. And again, line upon line and precept upon precept. I, I suppose that my brother, uh, who lives in Utah, who's been a Jehovah's Witness a year longer than I've been a Christian, caused me to really dig in deep. Because he always came up with these questions to try to make me doubt the Word of God, which made me study and get more and more proof. And so uh, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. If you've ever been in the mountains, way up high, like 9,000 feet or better, at night you can see the stars, all of them. It's like just all over the sky, like glitter everywhere. It's so beautiful. One of my favorite things to do was to go to Huntington Lake, and uh, especially just before winter, we would go up there and stand on the highest place we, we could find, which is probably about 8,000 feet, and the stars are just amazing. You could stare at them for hours. So in the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth, and the Bible says here, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Actually, day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. So in Psalm 24, if you just turn a couple pages over to 24... The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. And the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the flood. So I think we've established that God created the heaven and the earth. And let's take a look at John chapter 1 and verse 10 now. Talking about Jesus. He was in the world... And the world was made by him, but the world did not know him. Wow. Some things are right under our nose. And unless the Holy Spirit reveals that to us, we're not going to see it. And then we want to look at Hebrews chapter 1. So the book of Hebrews be to the right of the book of John. Just before the book of James. Hebrews, the first chapter. I had someone uh, ask me one time, how come you have us turn to all the Bible scriptures? I said, so you can wear the gold off the pages on your Bible. <laughs> okay. Hebrews chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Scripture says, God, who at sundry times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now we get into it. God made the worlds through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. God made the world through himself. And we're going to get deeper into that. Psalm 100 
in verse 3. Because the first things the, the cults will do is try to convince you that Jesus is not the Lord. And of course we know that every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, that he's God, is born of God, and every spirit that does not confess that is not of God. So Psalm 100 and verse 3 says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This isn't in your notes, but in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I, Jesus said, give unto them eternal life, and they will never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. For my Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of the Father's hand. And then he said, I and the Father are one. So there's more proof. There's so much proof that Jesus is God. There's some I just didn't list in here that are coming to my mind. But let's go ahead to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4. Hebrews 3 and verse 4. Every house has been built by some man. But he that built all things is God. Amen? All right, Colossians chapter 1, the book of Colossians to the left of Hebrews. We've turned past the T's. And you'll go Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. Colossians to the right of Philippians. And we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. Well, actually, let's start with verse 14. 13 ends up saying, In the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now we know for sure we're talking about Jesus. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Okay? He is the architect of every creature. The word firstborn uh, comes from the Greek word arche, and it's in other places in the scripture as well. It means architect. For by him, that's Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, whether they're visible or invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's what God says in uh, Isaiah 48, 11. He says, I do these things for my own name's sake. Why should my name be polluted? I will not give my glory to another. So he does it for his own name's sake. And verse 17 says, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So there's a little teaching right there I just want to bring out. In another version, it says, by him, by Christ, all things are held together. So scientists for years have studied the atom, and they see that there's a proton, a neutron, and an electron. And they've got that down. They know how that works. They just don't understand who's holding that together. Why doesn't the proton and the neutron fly off or the electron fly off? What keeps them going like this? By him, all things are held together. And if you'll study sometime in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says that things will be melted all of a sudden. The earth and the heavens will be melted with a great heat. That's what happens in an atomic explosion. When the atom is split, when the atom flies apart, there's a huge heat ball uh, in explosion. Can you imagine every atom on earth when G and in heaven, when Jesus lets go, what kind of explosion that is? In my opinion, that's what the lake of fire is going to be. I don't know. That's just my guess. But I believe that once all the heavens and the earth are on fire, 
It lines up with Revelation chapter 21, where John says in verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Amen? So, in Hebrews, see, I think we already read, or did we read? Yeah, we're in Colossians. Verse 17, so he is before all things, and by him all things are held together, or consist. Verse 18, Colossians 1.18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn. Now that word beginning is, is truly the Greek word arche. Because the cults will try to you know, convince you, oh, he had a beginning. No, he's eternal. Absolute, and we'll learn that here in Hebrews. Absolutely eternal. That word beginning, look it up in the Greek. It's the Greek word A-R-C-H-E. We get our word architect from that. So he is the architect. He is the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have preeminence. What does that mean? Well, that means that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And every knee will bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. He will have preeminence over everything. That's what the Father says. In verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. And then Colossians chapter 2 backs that up. Colossians chapter 2 starting with verse 6. Which says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Not Christ Jesus the man. Not Christ Jesus the good prophet. Or the saint. Or the devil's brother. But Jesus Christ the Lord. Okay? As you have received Jesus Christ the Lord. So walk in him. Being rooted and built up in him. Established in your faith. As you have been taught. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. And beware. I think that word should say, beware when you go to college that you don't get deceived. I think college is good. And college can help you to get a better job. But it can also teach you that there is no God. So you have to be very careful. And education is great. Just make sure that that education doesn't turn you away from the faith. Okay? Like the scripture says in Titus, they are ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead, bodily. So Jesus was the picture of God in the flesh. That's what they named him, Emmanuel. God is with us. Verse 10. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And then Isaiah chapter 43. If you'll turn back to the book of Isaiah. So I wanted to start out as we started this study to establish who Jesus is. So that there's no question when we look through the scriptures, there's no question who Jesus Christ is. He is God come to earth in the form of a man. And being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And because of that, God also highly exalted him and has given him, Christ, a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Things in heaven and things on earth, things under the earth. And every tongue will confess. Every tongue, including Satan's. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. So as we look at Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10. The scripture says, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord. I think Samuel got that point very clearly. When he led that young girl to Christ. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. You are my servant whom I have chosen. That you may know and believe me. 
and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. It's interesting, that was written in the Old Testament, and that's Yahweh speaking, and He's saying, there is no Savior besides me. And yet He said His Son, Jesus, has all preeminence, which makes Jesus Christ God. Now, you can't get that up here. That has to be gotten in here. And one of the ways that I've tried to describe this to people who are really struggling with that concept is I'm a person. I'm one man. I am a father to some children. I'm a grandfather to some others. I'm a brother to some other people. And I'm a son to my father and mother. I hold four different offices, but I'm just one person. So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit have different offices, but it's the same God. Okay? Uh, there's one I really wanted to give you that I love the scripture. It's in Luke chapter 10. So if someone isn't convinced after all of that, then you can take them to Luke chapter 10. This is the cannonball of scriptures right here, okay? Luke chapter 10, I'll give you some history. Seventy disciples were sent out by Jesus to go and heal the sick and cast out demons and, and, uh, and show his great glory on the earth. And so the 70 came back in verse 17, and this is what they said. And the 70 returned again with joy and said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through your name. Even the devils have to go when we say in the name of Jesus. And Jesus turned to them and said, I beheld or I saw or I witnessed Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now how old do you think Jesus was when he said that? He's between 30 and 33 years old. But he said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now we know that happened before in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Because Satan was cast down to a place that was dark without form and void. He was cast out into outer darkness. That's what this earth was. Before the Spirit of God moved upon the waters and said, let there be light. So he was here before we were here. And Jesus said, I saw him fall from heaven like lightning. So the question is, how in the world could a 30 to 33 year old man see something that happened over 4,000 years before that? Unless he's God. Amen? Amen? And that's the only conclusion you can come to. And they forgot to take that verse out of their Bible. So when they come to you with the New World Translation and say, how can he be God? How can he not be? So then you have to come to a conclusion of, is Jesus the truth teller? Or is he the biggest liar that ever lived? Well, he said himself, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Amen? Okay, that's the first three verses. Then let's go to verse 4. John chapter 1 and verse 4. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. So in John chapter 6 and verse 63, Jesus said, The flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. These words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. So the words that Jesus speaks are alive. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us that. The word of God is alive. Full of power. Sharper than any two-edged sword. God's words are alive. And I'll, I'll illustrate that to you. Um, I'd been saved about six months. And I was raised in a, in a Greek Orthodox family. And they're big givers. They like to give. 
So I had no problem with giving when I got saved and they said, oh, you should give, you know, and, and help God's ministry. No problem. Been doing it all my life. So my pastor got up one Sunday and was preaching on giving. I turned him off. It's like, this doesn't apply to me. I already do that. I already know all the stuff there is to know. You just give as unto the Lord as God has prospered you. I know that. So I turned him off. And he preached away for, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever it was. And at the end, I felt like I had to run up to the altar and repent. And unfortunately, my first pastor knew the giving records in the church. I don't know any of that. I don't know and I don't care. Ask Marcia. It's the very first thing I told her when I was appointed as pastor. I don't know who gives. I don't want to know who gives. I don't want to know who, how much they give. I just want you to tell me if we have enough money in the kitty to pay the bills. That's all I need to know. Because you start respecting persons when you, th oh, this one gives a lot. We don't want to offend them. Well, that one doesn't give anything, but just sit him in the corner. You know how that goes? That's in the book of James. The book of James says, if there comes unto you a rich man, you say, oh, sir, hit, sit here in a good place. But then another one comes in in bad clothing, uh, and you tell him, go sit in the corner, or go sit here under my stool. God says, are you not become judges of evil thoughts? God is not a respecter of persons, and neither should we be. God loves all of us the same. The ground is level at the cross. So, in, in, in him is life, and the life is the light of men. Let's take a look at John chapter 10 and verse 10. John 10 and verse 10. He gives us two choices in John chapter 10. You either believe the thief or you believe the Lord. Because the thief doesn't come only but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that's here. That's not just when we get to heaven. That's here. We can have abundant life here. We can be free of the spirit of fear that's flying all over our country. We can be free of all of that. We don't have to kowtow to that. We can just believe the truth that God has us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack any good thing. He makes me to lie down. In other words, he gives me peace. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. They're quiet. They're peaceful. God gives us peace. He's the prince of peace. He restores my soul. Yeah, the world's not going to do that. They're going to steal your soul and your money. <laughs> okay. John 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So in him is life. Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, 105. I believe it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let me see if I have that one right. Yep. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God is light. John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, God is light. And in him there's no darkness at all. No darkness, not even a shadow. Okay, so John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that believes in me or he that follows me shall no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen? So we've established now that Jesus is God and that he's our life and our light. So I always thought, well, when mom and dad came together, they made me. Nope. Mom and dad came together, but God made me. So let's turn to Psalm 139. Unless mom had some really long sewing needles. I don't think so. Psalm 139. Who made me? Well, mom and dad had to come together, that's for sure. But look what happened here. Verse 13 of Psalm 139. For you, talking about the Lord, have possessed my reins. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are marvelous, and my soul knows that right well. 
My substance was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and curiously worked on in the lowest parts of the earth, the mother's womb. Verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance yet being unperfect. And in your book, all of my parts were written, which in continuance were being fashioned, even when there was none of them. <laughs> how can that be? Well, how could God make the whole world out of nothing? He said he made us out of dust. Have you ever tried to make anything out of dust? Best you can do is a dust ball or a dust bunny, whatever they call them. You blow on dust and it goes away. You can't form anything out of dust. You at least have to have dirt. God says we're in Psalm 103, we're made of dust. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. And when I awake, I'm still with you. So now, take a look at, back at John chapter 1. And look again at verse 9. We're talking about the light. Amen? Jesus is the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. Now, I, I wondered about that verse. What does that mean? What that means is that he gives us the spark of life. Mom and dad don't do that. Mom and dad bring the components together, but the spark of life comes from God. That's the spark of life. And boy, you want to read the book of Job sometime. God says, I'll, I'll snuff your candle out. So if he lit our candle, he can take it and blow it away as well. And you can find that in the book of Job. That God snuffs out the light of the wicked. So he lights every man that comes into the world. Now if God lights every man into the world, that comes into the world, does that mean that God has revealed himself to every person that's come into the world? Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. It says that no man ought to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but every man ought to think soberly according, every man according to the measure of faith which God has dealt to every man. There's no such thing as an atheist. There's liars. We're well aware of that since March. But there's no such thing as an atheist because Everybody knows about God. Romans chapter 1 says, even the creation shows His Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that they are without excuse. So God is the one that brings in the light to everybody that's come. So we've established Jesus is God, and He's the light. So in verse 5, the, the scripture says, John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, but those who wish to remain in darkness can't comprehend the light. The Bible puts it another way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, when we're trying to talk, I remember this in my life before I was a Christian. People would talk to me about Jesus and it would be over my head. And I would think, boy, they flipped their lid. You know, it, it didn't register because I was in the darkness and the darkness doesn't comprehend the light. So it's not until the light comes in that you can really comprehend what the Lord is saying. So the light shines in the darkness, but those who wish to remain in darkness can't comprehend the light. And there's a good point there. You can't force anybody to come to Jesus. It has to be the Father that draws them. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. And there's only one other equation that has to happen with the Father drawing us. We have to open the door. If we don't open the door, the Lord won't come in. He doesn't kick the door down. You've probably seen that famous painting of Jesus knocking on the door. Look at it closely. There's no doorknob. That means the only doorknob on that door is inside. And so you open the door from inside. Once you open the door of your heart, Christ will come in. But he won't kick the door down. And we can't kick it down for people either. 
We have to bring them the light, bring them the truth. And it's up to them whether they want to obey that or not. So let's take a look at that. Romans chapter 1. This is the verse I was telling you about, that they're without excuse. Okay? So the book of Romans to the right of the book of John. Romans chapter 1, and starting with verse 18. says, Now the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. Because that which may be known about God has been shown to them. God has showed it to them. How do you do that? Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world have been clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even God's eternal power and Godhead, so they're without excuse. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, and everybody does, when they knew God, they would not glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now think about this. To believe that there's a creator, and to see a flower and how intricate it is inside, and you take all the other flowers in that bush, and they all look the same, you can, you can, you can look at them, there's no mistakes there. And then you see the skies and you, you see the stars and you wonder how come they don't fall? And you wonder how come the sun comes up every morning? How, who does that? And on and on and on. How come the waves come in but they don't come up on the street? They just stop at the sand and you wonder about all that. You don't need a whole lot of faith to believe there's a creator. Jesus said all you need is a grain of a mustard seed. But you got to have a lot of faith to believe that two rocks hit together and out crawled a frog. And then the frog turned into a bird and the bird turned into a man and the, or a monkey and then the monkey. Really? And that's exactly what Romans 1.22 says. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I mean, you tell children that story and they look at you and go, you're crazy. There's no way. I had a little three-year-old here this morning I was talking to, and I said, hey, uh, um, do, you, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, yes. And I said, do you believe he loves you? He, little Rowan, Hook's grandson. Yes. And he said, I saw that boy, Samuel, get baptized. I want to be baptized too. See, kids understand they have faith. They believe. You try to tell them a rock story, they're not going to believe that. They're going to say you're crazy. Bang two rocks together. They go out in the garden and bang two rocks together all day long. All they do is cut up their hands. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is a verse that I share often. It says, With all deceivableness and unrighteousness in those who perish, because they refuse to receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, God will send them a strong delusion and they will believe a lie that they all might be damned who had pleasure in unrighteousness and wouldn't believe the truth. And that's so true. If we refuse to receive the truth, we're going to believe the lie. There's only two things, the truth or the lie. You're either going to believe the truth or you're going to believe the lie. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, so we were in the book of Romans, 1 Corinthians 2, and verse 12 through 14. Now we have received, not the Spirit from the world, but the Spirit which is of God. We all have the Holy Spirit, amen? If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. Why are you so different? What happened in your life? What caused you to walk away from those things that were stumbling you? The Holy Spirit. He's our teacher. He guides us into all truth. Jesus said, I'm going to send him to you when I leave. And he'll be with you always. So we've received the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. 
which things also we speak, but not in the words that man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. And we compare spiritual things with spiritual things. But the natural man, he doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. He can't even know them because they are only understood spiritually or they're spiritually discerned. So what's the natural man? Well, we're trichotomy. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. But until we're born again, our spirit is dead. It's closed off to God. So the natural man is a man who has a body and a soul, but his spirit is in darkness. That's the natural man. He can't see the things of the Spirit of God until the light moves in, the Spirit of God moves in. Then that Spirit is born again. And that's why Jesus said you have to be born naturally of water through birth. And then you have to be born by the Spirit. And I know you all know this, but this is really good stuff to be able to give to people who doubt and who don't believe and who are lost and on their way to hell. I wish somebody would have shared all this with me. Some people told me, Jesus loved me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right over my head. But the first guy that actually sat and reasoned with me and said, do you know what you're signing up for if you reject the Lord? No, what am I signing up for? And then he taught me on hell. And once I got the full gospel, then I realized I need to be saved. Who wants to burn? And I mean, he shared really lovely verses with me. Like Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, where it says, And out of the pit of smoke came forth these creatures, locusts, upon the earth. And they had stingers in their tails, and they had faces like men, and teeth like lions, and hair like women, and they stung men for five months, and they tortured them. And those people couldn't die, and that was enough. Okay, that's enough. I don't want to be there. How do I get saved? Amen? But you've got to know the truth. You've got to know... Somebody's got to know they're lost before they can get saved. I've always been one to ask directions. I know a lot of people aren't like that. Uh, we'll find it. Man, I'm the first one to pull over to a 7-Eleven or someplace and just say, hey, how do I get to such and such? And then I make sure. Now, okay, so if I make a right up here and I go down how far? A couple miles, and then there's an intersection. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I don't want to drive around in circles. I just want to know how to get there. And, and the Lord has made it so simple for us to get there. Whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then there's people that try to complicate that. Well, yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, but, you know, don't ever cut your hair. Don't put makeup on. Got to wear a dress. I mean, it's crazy. It's man's religion. You'll never get that way. You'll never get to heaven that way. God says if you try to climb up some other way, you're a thief and a robber. That's in John chapter 10. If you climb up another way, there's only one way, one truth, one life. That's Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only way. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 How come people don't comprehend it? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it's a good question to ask. How come some people just don't get it? I mean, I didn't get it for 28 years. How come some people just don't get it? Well, because if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those that are lost. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. In whom... The God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's why Paul said, we don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for his sake. See, there's a lot of personalities out there that are like, man, you know, my teeth shine, my diamond shine, my suit shines, and you're attracted to me because I'm awesome. And they fill football stadiums and just feed them pablum. It's really sad. What's really, what really blessed me about Billy Graham's ministry, he filled stadiums, 
But he preached one thing and one thing only. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the most famous evangelist in the 20th century. Billy Graham. Because he only preached the gospel. And that's what God wants us to do. So in verses 6 through 8, John the Baptist, now we've, we've talked about Jesus. He's God. In him is life. In him is light. And that light is shining out in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't comprehend it. And then verses 6 through 8 talk about John the Baptist. See, the Lord never does anything on this earth without saying, I'm going to do something. So he sends a forerunner, or a prophet, in, in this case John the Baptist, to bear witness of the light that was coming. So he already gave the people from the law a warning about that, and it's found in Malachi chapter 3. So if you go to Matthew, first book in your New Testament, right across the page is the book of Malachi. Last book in the Old Testament, Malachi when I first got saved, I thought this, he was Italian and his name was Malachi. But, but, but I found out it's Malachi. Of course, it'll be a different pronunciation once we get to heaven. He'll tell us what the way to really say it. So Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Behold. Now remember, after this book was written, God didn't talk to his people again for 400 years. 400 years of silence. So no more words, no more prophetic utterances, nothing, until the light came. But before that happened, God sent a warning. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. I will send my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you will delight in. Behold, he will come saith the Lord of hosts. So God sent a warning. And then God sent a star. Once he was born, God, God sent a star way before to tell the wise man, he's coming. And finally, when they got there two years later, they found the young child in the house. But God sent the sign. So let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. That was another warning that something's going to happen. Something mighty. Isaiah 40 and verse 3 says, It'll be the voice of him who cries in the wilderness. He'll say, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then look at Matthew chapter 5, first book in the New Testament. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Now Jesus is speaking to us. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor or saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted? Then it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and be trodden under foot of men or stepped on. You are the light of the world. You are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and then put it under a bushel, but they put it on a candlestick. And it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And man, that happens when you know somebody that was just in darkness and then they get saved. And all of a sudden, they just their life turns around and they start telling people about the great thing that's happened to them. That's what Jesus was talking about. Acts chapter 13, if you turn to the book of Acts just before the book of Romans, Acts chapter 13, verse 24. Acts 13 and 24 talks about John, the forerunner of Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, as John fulfilled his course, he said, Who do you think that I am? I'm not he. But behold, there comes one after me, whose shoes of his feet I'm not even worthy 
to lose. So John gave God all the glory. I'm not him. I'm just coming to tell you that he's coming. And that was John the Baptist's ministry. So in verse 9, we're going to close our study tonight in verse 9. Jesus is the true light that lights every person that comes into this world. When we all were in our mother's womb, Jesus is the one that sparked us to life. You know, when you have a dead battery, you got to find somebody with a live battery and some jumper cables to bring that spark back into that battery to get it going again. And we were, certainly, we were, we were in our mother's womb and all the necessary parts were brought together except one the flash of light that lights every man that comes into the world and so in Psalm 139 we already read it but remember when he said I fashioned you when there were none of your parts even in existence so God knows everything about us and that's why it's so important for every one of us to believe we are who God made us to be. We're, we're not throwaways. We're not a waste. We're not a mistake. God has made each one of us exactly the way He wanted to make us. And then it's up to us to follow Him to fulfill what He's made us to be. But God doesn't make mistakes. I've had, you know, Paul said this, You who compare, uh, compare yourselves among yourselves are not wise. We should never compare ourselves to anyone else. We should never say, man, I, I want to be like that person. You know, no, you want to be like Jesus. Because I guarantee you, if you follow that person around long enough, that person will stumble you. I tell people this all the time, and I mean it. I mean it. When I come up here, I'm a different person. God gives me His Holy Spirit to run through me to give the message that He wants me to hear first, and then he wants you to hear so that we can grow in the Lord. But once I step out of here, I'm a human being. I'm not under God's control anymore unless I choose to be. So you're going to see me do stuff like, what? Like one day I went on a ride, a Harley ride. And uh, this guy kept bugging me all the time. My bike's faster than your bike. My bike's faster than yours. And I said, okay, well, let's find out. So we were on that road that goes uh, from... I don't know, uh, Los Alamos to pass the Vandenberg turnoff. And I was with some people that go to this church. And I just poured it on. I burned that guy so bad. And Kathy, the lady that was on the back of one of the bikes, turned around and said, is that our pastor? <laughs> I mean, I just disappeared out of sight like a jet plane. You know, we're human. We all either walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. But nobody walks in the Spirit 100% of the time except the Lord Jesus. That's not an excuse not to. It's just an observance that we are human. And we do things that humans do. That's why we have 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. <laughs> My favorite thing is when people say, I thought you were a Christian. Tell them, I'm just a pastor. <laughs> and that really throws them off then. We're human. Every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20 says, There's not even one good man on this earth that does good and doesn't sin. Not even one. That's clear in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Then in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 3, there's no one righteous. Not even one. Why? Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we need the light. That's why we need the light. So, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, we went to verse 1. Let's go to verse 3. So how did the Lord get this ball rolling? Remember, Jesus said, I saw Satan cast down from heaven to earth like lightning. Well, what was earth like? Look at verse 2. Well, before God did verse 3, He did verse 2. And He said, The earth was without form, and it was void, it was empty. 
and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's what it looked like. It was just a dark blob out of the universe. That's what earth was. But then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So that's what we've been talking about. That's why we have these lights. These lights are, they don't light up anything. They just remind us of the light during the Christmas season. That Jesus is the light. Isaiah 49 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. Let's, let's actually start in verse 5. That kind of backs up Psalm 139. Isaiah 49 and verse 5. And then verse 6. Everybody there? Okay. And now saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered, Yet shall I be glorified in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. For I will also give you for a light to the Gentiles that you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. The word Jesus can also be interpreted as deliverer, also as the word salvation. So when it says, he is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear in Psalm uh, 27, 1? He is my Jesus. He is my salvation. He's my deliverer. Amen? And then in 1 John 2, and that's where we'll end tonight. It's just now straight up 7 o'clock. 1 John chapter 2. And verse 8. The Apostle John, who spent time in heaven with the Lord, who wrote the book of Revelation, also wrote 1 John. And in the first letter that John wrote in verse 8, he says, A new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light is now shining. What I really like about the true light is I don't care how dark it is. When one light goes into a dark cavern, it lights the whole cavern up. And sometimes we don't need to say a word. We just have to have our presence there. I want to end with a little story. God is so good. Uh, when I used to do investigation work for the state of California... I got called in to do a stress claim. And they said, now be careful, this lady's flipped out. She's lost it. The, 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 the hospital police had to arrest her in the parking lot yesterday. So now she's coming in for a stress claim. You know, I want you to be very careful how you approach her because she's dangerous. Not a problem. So she comes into the room and I look at her and boy, is she flipped out. She is, all the screws have come loose. She's a nervous wreck. So I'm having to take my time with her, you know. Could you spell your name for me, please? You know, remember this, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. That's why cops don't make good investigators. Because, what's your name? Oh, well, I'm not, I'm not telling you. But if, what is your name? So she began to tell me her name, and I got through that, and I got through her address, and I got through about two paragraphs of her story, and she held up her hand, and she said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. She said, how do I get what you have? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you just are so peaceful. How do I get that? <laughs> I closed the investigation book and said, let me tell you. And led her to the Lord right there at the table. And it was about a week later I got called in for another case and, and some of the people at the hospital were saying, what did you say to that lady? And I said, I just told her the truth. 
she told me her story and I told her the truth. And they knew what I did because she was going around happy and at peace and dropped her stress claim. And there was no more of that because the Prince of Peace had moved in. And I believe with all my heart, all we have to do is ask. In troubled times, and we're in them, but in troubled times, there's, there's tools that we can use to not be stirred up. And one of those tools is shut off the lies. Shut them off. Evil people have an agenda. Do you remember the story about Hansel and Gretel? Some of you might not be old enough for that, but Hansel, oh, Samuel remembers it. Okay, so that, everybody knows it. Hansel, uh, Hansel and Gretel. Just the little trail of candy leading you right along. Pretty soon they got to the witch's house. That's exactly what the enemy does. He just pours out these lies. He pours out his spirit of fear, his spirit of intimidation, his spirit of, oh, you, you better do this or you'll be in trouble. Our front doors have been open now for three or four weeks. The police drove by First Christian and said, what are you guys doing outside? And they said, well, the governor said we had to be outside. They said, get inside. We don't have time for this. We have criminals to chase. It's all a facade. And I think it's been a big test to see how far can we push you until you push back. And I think we, just, we don't push, but we obey God. We just continue to obey God in His commands. You know, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Don't break your fellowship. Give one another a holy hug. Pray for one another. Preach the gospel. Sing praises unto the Lord. As long as you obey God, God will protect those whose mind is stayed upon Him. He'll keep you in perfect peace. When a man's ways please the Lord... He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Amen? So we either believe the word or we don't. Praise God. Jesus is the light. And that's the only tool we have right now in this world of darkness. Take the light out there. Amen? All right. God bless you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the teaching tonight. I just ask, Lord God, tonight that at least some of the things that I've said from your word would stick with us. Father, I believe that you are God, that you sent your only begotten Son, who also is God, and that he sent the Holy Spirit, who also is God. For you told us God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, I don't have to understand it uh, here in my mind but I believe it in my heart. And I know that your word is truth, and I pray that that truth will go out across the airwaves as folks listen to even this YouTube message and send it to others, Father, who need encouragement and teaching. So bless our time together. Bless this congregation tonight. I ask these things, Father, in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.